Thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. And thank you especially to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about some of the work that we do at the Max Planck Institute. So I'm going to tell you about why pulsars are astronomical clocks, some of the ways that we can use them. But I thought I'd kind of start out by telling you about a very early use that we found for these things. Um, and this is the uh, Pioneer plaque. So some of you probably know that the, um, the Pioneer and Voyager space probes that um, were launched in the, uh, in the 1970s, uh, they included this uh, plaque uh, that I display here uh, on the side. And this is basically um, a map, an interstellar map, to show where the spacecraft came from. So if you look at these, um, these lines that kind of radiate outwards from some, uh, some spot in the middle, uh, these all represent the distances to pulsars. Uh, the little tick marks on the, um, along the line represent the spin frequency. Uh, they all spin at different rates. And if you're interested, they, um, this, is in the, um, this, this uses the uh, natural hydrogen spin flip frequency as the unit of measurement. But um, people chose pulsars to put on this map because they knew that in tens of thousands of years, if an alien civilization came across this probe, uh, they'd be able to trace exactly where it came from uh, based only on the information um, on the side of it. So I thought that would be just kind of an interesting little introduction to what we're going to talk about today. Um, but let's go into some detail about what they are and how they were found. So pulsars were discovered in the 1960s by Jocelyn Bell. Um, that's her stood there during her PhD um, by the... Um, <clears throat> by the Cambridge Low Frequency Array that she helped to build with her own hands. Um, and the, uh, the topic of her research was she was looking for interplanetary scintillation patterns. Now, you don't really need to worry about what those are, just that this was some kind of um, random event that you might see um, appearing on and off in radio observations um, of interstellar space. But what she found one day was um, a series of something, some completely non-random pulses. So um, if you look at the, uh, the little plots that I've, uh, I've included there uh, at the top, you can, see these, um, you can see these little pulses against some kind of noise. And underneath that, she's just put a little line next to um, where each of these things appears. And these were found to be extremely regular, uh, exactly once every 1.337 seconds. So at first, the um, people thought, well, you know, this must be some man-made interference. It must be like a radar or something like that, you know, maybe at the military base, maybe at the airport. Except, oh, sorry, I'll be, uh, I'll be slightly louder. So yeah, um, they decided that it couldn't be man-made, though, because um, this signal actually rotated with the sky. Like, you, um, if you waited until 12 hours later when the Earth was pointing it uh, at the opposite side of the sky, you wouldn't see this. Um, and then, exactly at the same time of the day, uh, you point your telescope and there it is, the same periodic signal. So it was definitely coming from space. And then the next natural question to ask is, could this be aliens? Could this be um, an extraterrestrial signal? And this seemed unlikely as well, because um, if this were truly the case, you'd expect there to be some kind of Doppler shift of like the, um, uh, some alien species living on a planet that is orbiting a star. You'd expect to see this kind of like advance and delay of the signal uh, as the planet orbited its star. And then they started to also find um, signals like this from different patches of the sky with different spin frequencies, different properties. So they knew that this had to be some astrophysical phenomenon that they had never seen before. And it turned out that theoretical physics actually had a very good um, candidate for such an object. Uh, they knew it had to be something that was spinning really rapidly, um, since the signal that they found was every 1.3 seconds. And the... Um, the object that they, that they decided was a good candidate was um, something that hadn't been seen before, uh, called a neutron star. It had been theorized about 30 years ago, and theoretically it was actually very well understood, but at this point it was entirely hypothetical. And just to give a little bit of background, um, main sequence stars um, 
when they die, they end up as compact object. So if you have a, if you have a small star like the sun, uh, when it runs out of fuel, it will collapse into a white dwarf, which is something about the size of, uh, of the Earth. If you have a kind of medium-sized star, you end up with a neutron star as the, um, the product after the star has died. And this is the size of a city. This is what we're interested in today, but I thought I'd just give this, uh, this information since I talk about each of these objects um, uh, a little bit throughout this talk. And if you get a really massive star, when that collapses, it forms a black hole. Okay, so we have this candidate. Pulsars are rapidly spinning neutron stars. Um, how can we prove that? Well, we know that they're supposed to be born in supernovae. So we go and look in a nebula that's left over from a supernova. And we knew of such one. Uh, the Crab Nebula that um, uh, Chinese astronomers a thousand years ago recorded that um, the supernova event happened uh, later when we got sensitive telescopes. We, uh, we could see that it looked very much like um, the leftovers of a supernova explosion, and therefore there should be a neutron star in the middle. So they pointed the telescopes, and sure enough, there was a pulsar living there. And if you look at this little inlay, um, you can see some of the ripples that the pulsar wind actually causes um, when it uh, deposits energy into this nebula. And actually, just as a little aside, um, today we even see uh, neutron stars escaping from their nebulae. So I've pointed out a star that is just a neutron star that is just speeding out of this um, supernova remnant and going off into interstellar space. Okay, so so pulsars are extreme objects. Um, they weigh about uh, two times the mass of the sun. They're crushed into an area about the size of Frankfurt, and they spin. Um, at least once per second, but we can see later uh, that could be much more. So these are these are really extreme conditions. You know, this is a lot of mass in a small area spinning very very fast. And I can kind of show you what that. Oh, uh, very important. Uh, they also emit these beams out of the magnetic axes. These um, sweep over the Earth like a lighthouse, and we see them pulsing on and off. And I can show you what that looks like, and I hope this works. So every time the, the beam crosses the Earth, we see a pulse like this. And this is um, actually extremely stable. Um, it's a lot like the, um, the tick of a clock. Um, and I'm going to show you later why we can use that for interesting kinds of science. But, uh, but first I'll show you um, some other pulsars, because that one rotates once per second. And as far as pulsars go, that's actually extremely slow. Um, so this one is a bit more typical. So that's called the Vela Pulsar. That um, actually also um, lives in a supernova remnant, um, much like the one that I showed you earlier. And that rotates about 11 times per second, which is much more typical of uh, objects like this. But um, there's a class of pulsars that go even faster. So you can't even distinguish the individual pulses there, you just get this tone. So these are known as millisecond pulsars, and this one in particular spins once every 1.5 milliseconds, or this big number, 641 rotations per second. And I include all of those decimal points because we know that exactly. Uh, this is how precise these things spin, that we can say with confidence it spins exactly that many times per second. Um, just to give some context, that is faster than a kitchen blender. But it weighs twice as much as the sun and is the size of Frankfurt. It's truly incredible. Um, but as it turns out, uh, the, the faster pulsars spin, the more precise they are at being used as clocks. And ones like this actually rival atomic clocks in timing precision. Okay, so what? They're like clocks in space. Great. Really interesting. Well, it turns out that it's very useful having extremely precise clocks distributed all over the galaxy and, in a lot of cases, in extreme environments. Because we can use them for tests of physics that we can't do on the Earth or in space with other means. So I'm just going to give you um, a little example here. Um, 
some pulsars exist in binary orbits, so they uh, they orbit another star, or maybe even another compact object like uh, like another neutron star or a white dwarf. And just to kind of illustrate how precisely we can make measurements with these things, um, I'm just going to give. I'm not going to have too many of these like uh, plot things. Don't worry. But um, orbits are always a little bit elliptical. They're never circular. And we define an ellipse in terms of uh, these two axes that I've, uh, I've labeled here. Uh, or more specifically, the difference between these two axes that I've labeled. So for something like the Earth orbiting the Sun, um, the difference between these two axes is about 20,000 kilometers. Or in other terms, it's about twice the uh, diameter of the Earth. But I mean, this is... Uh, this is something like millions and millions of, uh, or hundreds of millions of kilometers across, so it's still quite precise to be able to measure that. However, in the case of a pulsar orbiting a white dwarf, we know this to within less than the width of a human hair. We can map out the entire orbit to the point where we know exactly where the pulsar is to much, much less than the width of a human hair. And this has very important applications in testing things like general relativity, where the effects are small, but when we have such precise atomic clock-like things in orbit around uh, extreme things, we can, we can actually start to see these and measure them. So another kind of um, more interesting example I can give is we remember that um, relativity predicts that space-time curves in the presence of massive objects. So in this like diagram at the top, you can see that you just have an ordinary kind of star and it causes like some curvature. And then you have a neutron star that has this like, massive gravitational well going on. Um, and the important thing to note is that if a pulse of um, radio ra radiation passes over this curved surface, it takes longer to travel than if it was just going over flat space-time. So there's some kind of delay associated with this when... Um, it passes by um, a massive star. So if we find pulsars that are in orbit around such objects, we can kind of map out this curvature and get really precise measurements of the masses. I have exactly one more plot after this, so don't worry about that. Then we're back to the, the nice animations. But what we can see here is that um, sort of on the left-hand side of the upper plot, we have um, the pulsar emitting a beam, and it's nowhere near the companion in its orbit. So on the bottom plot, there's a delay of zero microseconds. But then in the right-hand plots, the, the light is just kind of grazing its companion and it experiences this massive delay. And by using this, we can, we can measure the masses of uh, the objects around pulsars. And in this case, we know it to um, a, a tenth of a percent. And this is an incredible level of precision for something that's you know, thousands of uh, light years away. So something else that is kind of interesting about pulsars in binary orbits is that they emit gravitational waves. Um, and I can kind of show you a little bit um, about what that looks like. So there's no sound in this one. It's... Okay, so um, you kind of see these ripples on the, uh, the sort of space-time grid that um, as, the, uh, as the orbit is, is progressing. And remember that... Um, the light passing over over that kind of curvature gets delayed. And I'll talk a bit more about that later, but for now here's just um, some binary pulsars um, emitting some gravitational waves. But the thing is, um, the energy to create that gravitational radiation has to come from somewhere. So in this case it is converted from the orbital energy. So um, the orbit actually ends up shrinking as more orbital energy gets converted to gravitational waves. Uh, the orbit gets closer and closer, and we can actually measure that. Uh, th this won the 1993 Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, the first um, indirect evidence that gravitational waves exist. Uh, a binary pulsar was found. Um, they measured the size of the orbit for a number of years, and they found that it was shrinking in exact accordance with relativity. So this curved line isn't a fit. This is just the points laid over the, the top of that prediction from relativity. It matches almost exactly. 
And of course, if the orbit keeps on shrinking, eventually these things are going to collide. And in the last, uh, last one or two years, we've actually started to see evidence for that with LIGO, where they have detected gravitational waves from merging neutron stars. And in fact, over the last couple of months, they've been detecting many such events. So another um, really, really dramatic um, confirmation of this kind of model. But um, if, if you remember this animation that I showed you of um, the binary pulsars emitting gravitational waves, we actually want to try and detect gravitational waves using pulsars as well. So this is different to how LIGO does it. Um, LIGO is sensitive to gravitational waves from kind of um, objects about the mass of the sun. Uh, so on the other hand, uh, there are much bigger black holes, uh, billions of times the mass of the sun. And um, we observe that these exist in the centers of um, most or maybe all galaxies. Um, we even see um, that galaxies interact and merge. So we expect that there should be binary supermassive black holes um, in the universe. And if they exist, and we're pretty sure that they do, they should be extremely powerful sources of gravitational waves. So just to give a little bit more background on what gravitational waves do, they stretch and um, shrink space-time as the wave passes over your detector. Uh, like the, uh, this, uh, this little animation of some rings here. So if we observe a lot of pulsars all over the sky and look for kind of a pattern like this, where the, the pulses arrive later and then earlier and later and then earlier in some predictable kind of pattern, then we know that that has to be due to massive black hole binaries, billions of times the mass of the sun orbiting each other. Um, and I, I'm going to leave you with just one last animation, I think. I'm going to race through this, and you can, you can address um, questions at the end if you want, but it's kind of easier to show you what it looks like trying to detect these things. So it starts out where we have these two galaxies merging. But time scale for this is uh, hundreds of millions of years. You have the two black holes from the center. They form, a, they form an orbit with one another. They have this curved space-time, and they're emitting gravitational waves. And when they get closer and closer, uh, they start to emit gravitational waves at kind of um, with a period of tens of years, 10, 20, 30 years or something. And this is the regime that we are interested in, because this is what we can probe with pulsar timing. So here's the gravitational waves heading out towards our galaxy. And there's our radio telescope and a pulsar. So you see the, the change in color represents the, um, the delay and the um, advance of the signal. And as the wave passes over the Earth, we can see that effect in the pulsar. And this is what we hope to be able to achieve. Um, we're not there quite yet. Uh, you need very, very long data sets, like decades long. You need really, really precise measurements, and you need uh, you need really, really sensitive telescopes. But the longer we keep on observing, the more chance there is we're going to see this. And it will happen one day in the coming years. So I'll just kind of leave you with this, um, this picture. Um, a lot of you will recognize this as the album cover, um, Unknown Pleasures from Joy Division. And this is, a, this is a train of pulses from the first pulsar that was discovered, uh, the one way back on the, um, one of the first slides. So pulsars are astronomical clocks, and they allow precision measurements of um, extreme objects that are not possible with any other techniques. Um, thank you very much for having me, and I look forward to uh, answering your questions. Thank you.